Hi everyone, my name is Catherine, and I just want to thank the Patchogue Medford Library for welcoming me back to talk about this um, beautiful, magnificent butterfly known as the monarch butterfly. And what makes this monarch uh, butterfly so amazing is that it makes an epic migration, and I say epic because for a tiny little butterfly to fly about 3,000 miles down south to the mountains of Mexico, to the Oymel fir forest in Michoacan is quite an adventure. Um, and today I actually have a chrysalis. I have a butterfly that is about to emerge from a chrysalis and is ready to go. I'm gonna show it to you right now. Here you go, I'm gonna bring it up close. As you could see, you could see the wing color right through there and it's translucent. Before it, before it becomes translucent like this, it is a beautiful jade green. I'll show you that. Here. And these little caterpillars decided to form their chrysalis right on these Tupperware cups that I use for my um, milkweed um, stalks to keep them hydrated so they have food to eat because we do raise them on our porch and butterfly nets which I'm going to talk about later. Okay. So the monarch butterfly makes this epic migration and right now and I'm thinking this might be a fall migrator because of the time of year that it is. But in, on Long Island, the peak migration is in September, mid-September. So you're going to see the majority of these monarchs passing through Long Island in mid-September. And some awesome places that you can witness that are by the shorelines because this is where they rest before they take off again and fly, continue to fly south. So I would say like Montauk, be a great place to see these butterflies um, fire islands or even at our ferry terminal here in patch hog would be an awesome spot to maybe witness some clustering monarch butterflies and the best time to see that would be in the morning because monarchs don't fly during the night time so what they'll do is they'll find a spot to cluster together um, and they will group together on a bush or a plant or a tree and then they will head back south. They'll head south flying when the sun comes up and their wings are warm and they'll continue on. So the best time of day to actually see a monarch butterfly uh, or a bunch of them together would be early morning, mid-September. Now, um, these butterflies are pretty fascinating because the fall migration they call a super generation of monarch. And they call it a super generation of monarch because these monarchs live from eight to nine months long, where your spring migrators heading north live about three to five weeks. The spring migrators only live a shorter period of time because their main job is to mate, to lay eggs, and then they die. And then those eggs will hatch into caterpillars and then form into butterflies, and then those butterflies will head north. And it takes five generations to get here, and that fifth generation which we usually see around now is the generation that is going to make this incredible journey. Another difference between the spring and the fall migrators is that um, the fall migrators, their reproductive system is actually placed on like pause and they make this journey. There's no mating, there's no laying eggs. Their ultimate job is to fly, is to um, get enough nectar to fuel their journey and also enough nectar to store fat in order to overwinter at these sites in central Mexico. Now, one more thing I'm going to say is that this monarch has never been to Mexico. And it's basically like the great, great granddaughter or grandson of the one that left that overwintering spot to head north to lay those eggs before it died. Now, although it's never been to Mexico, it's just going to know to go there. And all the butterflies, whether they're from Canada or Ohio or wherever we, they're coming from, um, they just know to go there. And I think that's pretty spectacular and makes this uh, butterfly just amazing. And I, I, me and my family have become very um, in love uh, with this butterfly. So, um, the last time I submitted a video, I basically talked about a little bit about their migration and I talked about how um, some obstacles that they face and as a community, how we can help them along on their journey. 
Um, so like I said, we can plant milkweed. And if you didn't want to plant milkweed, we could at least plant some native wildflowers for them to help them along on their journey. Um, I, my garden has become a monarch way station where I have plenty of milkweed, I have butterfly weed, I have lots of native wildflowers and shelter for them. Um, and it's, it's a neat thing to be part of. And there's a monarch, monarch watch site online where you can get information on how to go about doing that. Or you could always contact me if you're interested in creating a butterfly garden. I could help guide you on some great flowers to plant and um, things that you would need to do this. Um, so I'm going to bring you down to my garden. I'm just going to show you the milkweed that I do have. It's swamp milkweed. And it has died down a little bit because it is the end of summer. So there aren't so many blooms. But a lot of those blooms have become seed pods, which I do um, cut and tend to often because they do seed a lot. So I'll cut them and throw them out and always make sure there's no eggs or caterpillars on those um, but I'm gonna bring you over there so you can see the garden also before I do leave, if you look behind me you'll see these are all annual flowers besides the Joe pie weed that I did plant which is a favorite of monarchs it's a perennial and that is a late summer bloomer but behind me we have zinnias and we have Mexican sunflowers and they are favorites of monarchs as well as a lot of other butterflies and um, they will not die until the first frost sets in. So you'll have these all the way into the fall. They stay beautiful just like this, and they're really easy to plant from seed right in the ground. So I would suggest planting those, um, and they're easy to take care of. Um, okay, I'm gonna bring you down to my garden and hope that this guy doesn't emerge while we're there. Okay, so we're in my garden. I'm just gonna show you, we have some um, here, we have some succulent plants. I have some um, sage and catmint. Um, here you can see my, oh, put this like this, my echinacea is kind of dying off the flowers, but my black eyed Susans are doing great here. Cause the last time you guys, everybody visited my garden, there were no flowers yet. Cause it was super early. This is butterfly weed. They're beautiful orange flowers. Monarchs will lay their eggs on these as well. Here we have yellow flowers. And back here, we have our milkweed. So I have pretty much a large area of milkweed, which I tend to, and you don't need this much milkweed. A lot of this is because I didn't do so great on cutting those seed pods last year. Um, but basically, a monarch butterfly will lay its eggs on the bottom uh, on the underneath side of a milkweed leaf and that egg will um, hatch in about three to five days and a tiny little caterpillar will emerge and that caterpillar is literally the size of a like a pin tip super tiny um, let me see if we could see if there's any eggs here I do have some eggs to show you so I'm not going to start searching through the garden now but um, I'm trying to see if we could see any of the flowers because really for most of the summer, there are so many flowers in this garden. It's beautiful and they even have a, oh, here we go. These are the flowers of the swamp milkweed. There's also a little paper wasp in there, which are predators of our uh, poor monarch caterpillars. Um, all right, I'm going to take you out of the garden and I'm going to show you some eggs and some caterpillars and show you the whole process and life cycle of this awesome butterfly. Okay, so I'm back here over by my station where I have lots of examples of eggs and caterpillars to show you. Um, so here I have a leaf, it's a milkweed leaf, and while I was going through the garden I noticed, I don't know if you could see it, but there's a tiny little egg right there. It's a little white egg. And that egg is going to hatch in about three to five days. And we'll see a tiny little caterpillar. And when I say tiny, I mean tiny. I'm going to look for one right now. Oh, here we go. Oh, my goodness. I don't even know if you're going to be able to see this guy. All right. Let's see. Ah. Oh, gosh. Can you see him? There. See how tiny? Oh, my goodness. The tiniest, tiniest little guy or girl. I'm not sure if it's a male or female. But... That's how tiny they are when they start off. And now a caterpillar, what it does is 
it has growth stages and those growth stages are um, basically we we know what growth stage they're in based on how many molts that they've had so a caterpillar molts its skin they shed so the little um, the little guy there would be a new hatchling you have a first instar and it, they, they there's five instars so it's first instar second third fourth and fifth the fifth instar would be the biggest caterpillar that you have and that caterpillar is the one that will um, end up leaving the milkweed and looking for a great spot to form a chrysalis. So here I have an image that I took the other day of a caterpillar actually molting its skin. And you can see the skin right behind it, right there. That was probably a third instar caterpillar. And here I have an image that shows all the different sizes. So here we had tiny, like I just showed you. And then you have your second instar, your third, your fourth, and your fifth. And then this is the one that will end up leaving to form a chrysalis. And when it does this, it basically wanders away from its milkweed. And it can wander, I don't know, even up to like 30 feet away from where it was. And it will form a chrysalis. And by doing this, it actually forms a silk button, which it will hang from. And it hangs in like a J position. And as it's hanging, it will hang there for about 24 hours before it sheds its last layer of skin. And that last layer exposes this beautiful jade colored chrysalis. Um, and it will stay a chrysalis for about 12 to 14 days. And then you will see, like I just showed you, it will turn from a jade color to translucent and a butterfly will emerge. And when that butterfly emerges, it will hang and its wings will be a little crumbly and wet but it will pump fluid to those wings where they will straighten out and it will need about two hours to dry those wings and also while it's hanging it's zipping its proboscis which is basically like a straw that they use to feed um, from the flowers to get their nectar and zipping is basically they need to um, like seal it because there's two pieces they need to seal it together to form that straw in order to feed so those are the two most important things that this monarch cat, uh, butterfly will need to do right after it exits that chrysalis shell. Okay, so this is the last example I'm going to show you of a caterpillar. Um, this is a larger caterpillar. I don't know if you could see it. Here we go. There he is. And I would say that this, let me bring it a little closer, is a fourth or maybe fifth in star caterpillar. He's chomping away on leaves. And it's amazing to see how that little tiny dot of a caterpillar can get this large and beautiful. The markings I think are incredible. So this guy, and as you can see, I had milkweed clippings here and a little glad Tupperware cup filled with water to keep him nice and fresh. And I'm gonna put him in an enclosure right next to me um, where he'll be safe from predators. Now, I raise some monarch caterpillars on my porch and I do that because unfortunately in the wild caterpillars have a lot of predators um, also some people will do it in their home but I find it better to do it outside because it kind of mimics their natural environment um, also inside there are things that could be harmful to these caterpillars such as the air conditioner dries the air so they don't have the humidity the moisture that they need um, flea and tick medication on your animals if you touch them and then t go near the enclosure this could affect them um, cleaning products or even like hand lotion can also bother them as uh, well <clears throat> so I raise them outside on the porch another uh, important thing on raising them outside is that they have exposure to the cold when the weather changes um, they know that by the position of the Sun that the seasons are changing and this kind of triggers something within them as caterpillars to know that they need to migrate and so this is another reason why um, raising them outside is important now if you did want to if you did want to raise a monarch caterpillar or many monarch caterpillars you can do that or if you wanted to just plant milkweed in your garden and let nature be then that's great too but anything to help these guys out I think is um, a good thing now the predators that they do have um, outside are pesticides that people may use um, another predator that they have are like I just um, 
paper wasps. They eat caterpillars. Spiders will eat caterpillars. And um, there's also parasitic um, wasps and flies that will lay their egg larva on them. And the last thing that they um, have a big problem with is that there is a microscopic parasite um, that can affect them in a bad way in that um, after they form their chrysalis, when they come out, they could either emerge deformed or they can't leave their chrysalis at all and they're too weak to fly. And um, these are the problems that they face. So by taking them in, and especially young, or when you find them as eggs, um, kind of helps them out a bit. You figure every female monarch lays three to 500 eggs. And they lay so many because the likelihood that most of them will make it is not very likely. So because of this, um, I mean, even taking a couple in, you figure you're increasing their chances of survival by just a little bit. So that's why we do what we do here. So my family loves helping the monarch caterpillars and the monarch butterflies and helping them on their journey by planting native wildflowers and planting milkweed for them to help them reproduce. And um, if anyone is interested in doing the same, you can contact me and I can help you with that. Um, it's very simple to raise them with these net enclosures. Um, it's a fun thing to do with your family and with your kids. My daughter absolutely enjoys it. And every butterfly that she lets go, she says goodbye and wishes them you know, a safe trip on their journey this time of year. And um, I think it's a great thing. They are, their numbers have decreased very much so over the years. And there are many reasons for that. Pesticide use is one, lack of native milkweed that is growing just due to population growth. Um, also, um, population growth has more cars on the road. So as they're traveling, on the highways and passing through a lot of them have accidents and also their overwintering sites in Mexico have been greatly decreased due to logging and farming so um, that is also a big problem so really anything we do whether it's just planting native flowers planting milkweed or if you want to take care of them on your porch any little bit helps and um, if anyone wants to do this or needs help or needs advice uh, you could either message me on my instagram page which is patch hog butterfly patch or um you can contact the library and they can contact me or give my email to you but this is something that i find very important and we'd like to see them in the future and for our children to be able to enjoy them in the future as well so thank you so much for your time and for listening Hope I didn't go on too much. I had so much I wanted to say and share, and I hope it was informative and um, not too much to take in. So thanks again. Um, thank you again. And I am also going to pause this video and I'm going to wait for this little one to emerge so everybody can actually see a butterfly emerging from its chrysalis, drying its wings, and um, it's really such a beautiful thing to watch. So I'm gonna sit here and I'm gonna wait and when this happens, I will turn the camera back on. Thanks. All right, this monarch is emerging from its chrysalis. I almost missed it. And what I'll do after it completely emerges is I will let it hang in an enclosure and it will need to dry its wings for about two hours. It's amazing. I think it's absolutely amazing. and it will just hold on to that chrysalis. And you see how tiny those wings are? 
how small those wings are right now. It will pump fluid to those wings, which will flatten them out and enlarge them. And I don't know if you can see that it's actually working on zipping that proboscis that it uses to feed as it hangs. It's really so incredible. I think I can pause it and I could show you afterward. I don't know. All right, so I'll pause it now and after I will show you this butterfly with its wings fully inflated and dry and then maybe we can even release it. Although it is starting to rain a bit, so maybe we'll have to wait a while. All right, thank you everyone for your time. I'm glad you all got to witness this beauty emerge from this chrysalis. And um, again, if you have any questions, please feel free to contact me. And thank you again to the Pat Med Library for uh, allowing me to talk a little more about this awesome creature. All right, so Lucy has brought our monarch that emerged earlier this morning um, out to a flower oh. and it just flew onto you. Look at that beauty. I think it thinks, is a female. I think it thinks, I think she thinks that my shirt is semi pollen. Maybe she thinks you're her mama. <laughs> no, 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 I think I anyway, I'm going to take, let me, oops, there you go. You. Sorry, lady. Thank Sorry, you. Thank lady. you. Thank you. We're going to put her right back on that zinnia and she's going to hang oh, out. Thanks. And when she's ready, yeah. she will fly okay. off. All right. So thanks everybody for joining. What do you say, Lou? Bye. And thank you. Thank you <laughs> okay. for watching. Bye. Bye.